Um, Pastor Ed, you did a great job on those announcements. Uh, I would like to add something, pictures, you know. Uh, I'm going to go this again. Please get your picture taken. If you're not signed up, walk over there and get it. If you do not get your picture taken, we will not have a pictorial directory for you. They will only give us as many as pe picture, pictorial directories as we have pictures. So if you want a picture of everybody else that's who's in the church to be able to keep us a memento in 15 years, look back on it, you got to get your picture taken, okay? That's the only way you get a pictorial directory. Plus, you get a free 8 and a half by 11, okay? So um, they've, they've grace, they have slots in there where you can pick up. Yeah, they're going to try to sell you pictures. Just learn how to say this. Listen. N-O. No, okay? If you don't have money, don't take a picture. But you get the 8 and a half by 10. We need you in this directory, okay? Um, don't come crying to me in five weeks. Can I have one of those directories? We don't, sorry, we don't have any extras left over. Sorry. You don't. They had names on them. So please do that. Second thing is, I thought you were very gracious saying we need some additional funds for back hair. <laughs> Plain talk, we're out of money. <laughs> we don't get even left to pay for the rest of it. So uh, consider if you're, your gifts are there. We got the floor to go in yet. Well, we're going back and forth on a couple different options, but one option is the uh, option that I think is okay, but then there's the option that people think we really need to have on there. It's really nice, you know, but it's about eight grand more, and we don't have enough to pay for even what we have. So uh, if, you, if the Lord lays on your heart to do that, I'm not begging. God will bring the money in, you know, and, and well, that if you take a walk back there, don't stick your hand in any plugs or anything. Uh, you know, that's not a good thing, but uh, it, uh, you walk in, you get the sense for what the space looks like. It's going to be great. So we've got uh, a couple more weeks of labor costs. We've got the ceiling to pay for, the floor to pay for, and uh, hopefully we won't go broke, <laughs> okay? Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's neat when you walk back there and see what it's like. So today we're starting our, uh, well, we're continuing our series. We actually started with the introduction last week on John, 1 John. So if you want to start looking for that, the easiest way to find 1 John in your Bible is to go to the very end of your Bible and start working back from Revelation. Pick out a Bible in the pew if you don't have one and start going back and taking a look at what's there. Um, the, and I forgot to bring it in with me. I was going to bring in the, the book of John is the book. First John and the Gospel of John are the, the books that I would consider the simple books, the plain truth in the scriptures. Um, when a person first comes to Jesus Christ, uh, and they say, what do I read in the Bible? You know, well, don't start in, don't start in Leviticus, you know, a third book. You're going to be in trouble already, you know. Um, the Gospel of John is a great book to read. The second book, or the, the second choice, or maybe in the first choice, would be First John, what we're looking at today. Very plain, very uh, personal, very accurate. In fact, it's so simple that when I took my Greek class, this was the book they chose that we had to translate. Okay, so I can actually read some of it still, you know. But it's, a, it's basic, basic word structure, but very clear. And I want to start out with one thing that I think is kind of interesting, and that's the very beginning of the book. Now we're going to see, who has your Bibles open? Because I'm going to ask you, what's the first couple words of the, chap of the book? Come on. First John 1, what's it say in the first beginning of it? That is from the beginning, okay? Now, if you couldn't tell me that, that means you don't have your Bible open. You need to pull your Bible out or your iPhone or your iPad or whatever you have for your Bible, okay? So you can look at this. We're going the first four verses this morning, but it says, what was from the beginning? Now, how many people recognize that as being related to some other place in the Bible besides you, Dad? Uh, my, my, my resident Bible scholar here and my, okay, my wife, uh, anybody else? In the beginning, anybody else recognize that? Okay, where does in the beginning come from? You're half right. Gospel of John, correct. Two places, the Gospel of John, and guess who wrote this? John, right? God did, but John, and in the beginning. So um, far be it to me to be better than all the church fathers, but if I were ordering the, the, the New Testament, John would be the first book in the New Testament, the Gospel of John. Okay, and many others have said that before me, um, because I think it would parallel so well. Old Testament starts in the beginning. What? God. New Testament starts in the beginning. The Word. Who's the Word? Jesus. So in the beginning, God. In the beginning, Jesus. That's the way I think the New Testament. And then you have the easiest book starting the New Testament when people read it. So that's the way I would have done it. But you know, in hindsight, you can always quarterback a game afterwards, can't you? When you put it together. We won't talk about last week's Eagles game, really. Uh, what game, right? <laughs> I told them they shouldn't have gotten rid of Tim Tebow. <clears throat> they lost all the Christians' prayers when they did that. Well, anyway, well, but let's go on. <laughs> uh, so in the beginning, Old Testament, in the beginning, John. Now, we read, read here, what was from the 
beginning. So we're starting at the beginning part. And if we don't realize that Jesus Christ is God, you might as well go back to the beginning. That's the key. Okay? Today we're going to look at a few other things and that are going to tell us why uh, this book is such an important book or so credible of a book. But how many of you have ever t had a discussion with somebody else about the Bible and they said, oh, that's just a bunch of myths? Anybody ever, everybody ever heard of that? Okay? Anybody heard that's, that's two, 4,000 years old? It can't be accurate. Anybody hear that? Okay? Let's take a look. Oh, let me start out. Let me get one other thing. How many people in here like Perry Mason? Okay. That's become a favorite at our house. We record them all. We go, we go back to the, you know, if we go back, well, don't have anything to watch. Okay, we'll watch a Perry Mason. I don't know. I watched that one. I watched that one. I, she knows them all. You know, I mean, we, get, we have to wait three weeks before we find one we don't know. How about Matlock? Anybody like Matlock? Okay. Now, when they go into court, this is really leading someplace. <laughs> when they go into court, what kind of evidence are they looking for? The truth. Are they looking for, well, I, I, he, they see this. This is hearsay. Everyone heard of that? What's hearsay evidence? Second hand, third hand, fourth hand, rumors. When you go to court, what do you need? First hands or what? Eyewitness accounts. Anything else doesn't count. Oh, they can't testify that. They didn't hear that personally. They didn't see that. Per That's just their opinion. We need first-hand accounts. Look with me as we start this section today. John is going to lay it out plain, plainly for us. Um, the word of life is what I've entitled this first section here. Read verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of of life. When people come up and say, you know, it's just a myth or you don't, this is a first hand account. How many times you have an argument with somebody else, not just over the Bible, but anything, and said, well, you didn't hear that. How do you know that? I saw it with my own eyes. Then it's all of a sudden convincing, isn't it? If you see it with your own eyes or you talk to somebody who was actually there, then you know. How many of you people know who George Washington was? Okay, a few people need to go back to school. Uh, <laughs> how many people knew Abraham Lincoln was? Now, how did you find out about George Washington? A history book. Did George Washington write the history book? Did one of his generals write that history book? Who'd you hear from? A school teacher? How'd the school teacher learn it? A history book. The school teacher wasn't there, were they? They keep on. Do you have any? Does anybody here know that they found out about George Washington from personal writings of George Washington telling what he did? How many people saw those first writings? Those original writings, and, and, and know those? Very few. You might be able to find a letter. No, no, Dad did not live when George Washington was here. <laughs> uh, you know, um, we have more when we look at this verse we realize we have more accurate eyewitness account of Jesus Christ than we have of George Washington. And if your friends and family believe in George Washington, then they sure better not call this a myth because this is a first-hand account. Amen. And when you look in John chapter 20, verse 31, it says the same thing. It says, These are things I have written that you may believe and know that Jesus is the Son of God. You'll find that also in 1 John because this is a first-hand account. Now, let's just take a look at a couple of these things here. First of all, it's the word of life, and then the first, if you're filling out your little papers there, A is we heard it. There are three disciples that oftentimes we find together. Who are they? Peter, James, and John. Thank you. Peter, James, and John. They went through a lot of things. Now, the 12 saw a lot of stuff happen. They were with Jesus for three years. Um, they saw a lot of things. They went and reported it, and that's one reason why they were there is because they saw this stuff, and they were able to go. Thomas went to India, you know, and others went around. I mean, they went all over the world and, and, and various places and told the, the gospel and preached it. You know, we know, the, we know where Peter went and so forth, but they say we heard it. Peter, James, and John, they were the only ones on the Mount of Transfiguration when that took place. They were in the house with Jairus. 
when he raised his daughter from the dead. He said, all the other subs said, you three guys come in with me. They were there. They were near him in the Garden of Gethsemane. John, as we found last week, was the only guy that showed up at the cross. The only disciple. John and Peter were, as far as we know, the only two that followed him into the trial. Now you say, well, so we don't see John there. Okay, he talks about Peter, but who's talking about it? John. John actually, we believe, was a relative. And it says he was a relative of one of the priests that were involved with that. So he had close hand information there and was possibly even very close at hand. So the, they heard these things, and it's just like as we saw with Perry Mason or, or John Matt or, or, or Matlock, you know, have you seen personally John has done that. Then it says, we heard it and we also saw it. We beheld it, or and beheld here. It says it says both we saw it and we beheld it. See is something you know we know what see is right. Visualize. Beheld was to understand, to actually look at something. Have you ever have you ever driven by something and you kind of saw it, but you really didn't see it? I mean, you kind of saw it. You knew it was there, you know. And if someone asked you, did you see that that woman standing there? Well, yeah, I saw her standing. Well, what was she wearing? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I saw her, you know. But I mean, if you if she would look unusual, you know, it was the middle of, of summer and she's dressed in a top fur coat with a really fancy hat with a feather coming out of it, you know, and you drive past. Now you you're gonna look closely. Oh, now you behold her. You you saw her, but you also knew what she looked like. You really studied her. And if anybody asks, you know all the details. I mean, that little that that eagle's feather coming out of her hat looked really weird, you know. So you beheld her. And that's what he's saying here. We didn't only see, but we also beheld. In John 1.14, this is what the word says. This is what John again is writing. He says, and the word, who is what again? Who's who? Who's the word? Jesus, okay. The word in the beginning was the God. In the beginning was the word. So the word's Jesus. He said in John 1.14, and if you want to return your Bibles and you're thinking about, I suggest you underline your Bible or if it's easier for you, circle the verse, okay, so you can go back and remember it. I would do that to 114. It's a very important verse. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ became flesh. Emmanuel means what? God with us. Emmanuel, God became flesh, Jesus became flesh, we beheld him, we saw him, we lived with him. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, this is kind of called the gospel in a nutshell sometimes, it says this, in verses 5 through 8, this is Paul writing, and he appeared, he's talking about who he appeared to, who experienced it. If you need eyewitness accounts, now, um, how are we going to do it today? Well, we can go back 2,000 years. But at this time, when 1 Corinthians is being written, maybe 50 AD, remember, these people are still alive. If they wanted to disprove it, all they'd have to go is find these people and say, this person, did this happen or is he lying about you? Because they were still there. They were still living. This is, this is within 20 years of Jesus Christ's death that Paul's writing this. And Paul says this, after talking about the gospel and the resurrection, he says these words, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 8. Then he appeared, Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, to Cephas, who was Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Listen to this. Most of whom remain until today. So most of these 500 people are still alive. You don't believe it? Go find them. They'll easily tell you. And if you say it's an hallucination, hallucination, somebody's on drugs, when's the last time that 500 people had the same exact hallucination? I've heard a lot of hallucinations, but never 500 people having the same stuff at the same time. Let me read on. But some have fallen asleep. So in those last 20 years, some have died, obviously. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and then lastly of all, as it were to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. And you remember, Jesus Christ appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, okay? And he, was, he saw him, he says, why are you persecuting me? So Paul actually saw the risen Christ, and he knew much about him. This guy was, was educated with the Sanhedrin. He knew all about Jesus. It was the discussion of the day. I mean, the Sanhedrin had murdered this guy just 20 years earlier. 
Paul very well might have been a little boy being trained by these guys at the very time Jesus Christ was killed. So he knew about it. And so he knew what he, he, he very well may have seen him. I don't know, I can't prove that. But he may have seen him in fleshly form at some point. He probably knew somewhat what he looked like. And he saw him himself. So the proof is here, this guy, Jesus Christ, was risen from the dead, seen by all these people, most of whom were still living at the time of the writing of this book, 1 Corinthians, and they can prove what I say. We saw it and we beheld it. We lived with this guy for three years. Don't tell me I just saw him by the street corner and didn't know it had the wrong guy. He knew him intimately. And as we learned last, light, last week, he was the one who they, he often calls the beloved disciple. He's the one who Jesus loved. And actually, I think if I recall correctly, uh, they were believed to have been cousins related at some point. So at any rate, th- he knew him well. The third thing he says, and this is interesting, he says, we handled it. We handled him. Now, if you're holding something in your hand, um, do you have a cell phone with you? Okay, can I see it? Sure. Oh, you're going to give it to me? Is that what you're asking? Well, I thought I wanted, I said I, I asked if I could see it. But you gave it to me. When you see it, I mean, you were always showing it to me. I mean, wasn't I seeing it when I looked there? I guess so. <laughs> Point proven, right? If I say I want to see something, what am I saying? Give it to me. I want to hold it. I want to handle it. And so when he says here, please let me see, it's like a kid. You've got a child now, little one. If she says, I want to see it, does she say, oh, let me see it so I can stare at it? She grabs it from both hands, just like the microphone last Sunday, right? <laughs> let me see the microphone. I want to talk, you know? Um, kids see with their hands. He wants people to know, not only do we see him from afar, but we handle him. When he says, I see him, it means, can I see him? It means, I handled Jesus Christ. I touched him. At the Last Supper, he laid right beside me. I mean, we all inclined, we reclined when we ate, and he was right there. I was touching him. We handled the word of God. And if you, if you think that he's talking about something specifically, let's go back to John's gospel himself. This is the same guy again writing in chapter 20 of his gospel. This is what he writes about Thomas. Remember doubting Thomas? Okay, here's what he writes. And when he said this, he showed them, this is Jesus Christ walking up, he showed them his hands and his side. Remember the, the, the slit in the slide from the sword and his hands with the nails. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. The other disciples therefore were saying to him, to this is to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, what's see mean? Put them in there, you know. Unless I see the imprints of the nails and put my hand to the side, I will not believe. Then he said to Thomas, reach here your finger and put it in my hand and put it into my side and be not unbelieving but believing. Now, I don't know if you'd want to do that, but have a hole in your hand from the cross and Thomas is put it in. Thomas says, I'm not going to put it in there. I believe you, Christ. You know, I believe you. I, I don't need to stick my finger in that, in that ugly wound where the blood is. I believe. And then Jesus said this, and I believe he's talking to us. He said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Who's that? That's you and me. That's you if you believe. If you've come to have personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's you. If not, then it's not you yet. But with all this evidence, you've got to decide. As you read this book of John, and as you see what he says, is this accurate? Is this true? Does this guy know what he's talking about? Or is he like my teacher at school, who never saw George Washington, never saw any personal documents They may be saying, in fact, similes or pictures of him. Never saw any personal documents from George Washington. Never talked to him. And yet they still believe. The second point as we go, and before we go on to the second point, let me just give you an overview here. Um, This document is written on best evidence. Best evidence. And my lesson here is the Bible is reliable. The Bible is reliable. Do you believe it's reliable? 
Do your friends believe it's reliable? No. Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> and if they don't believe it's reliable, what are their chances of getting to heaven? Pretty slim, huh? Pretty slim. So there's a lot of people out there that look at you as being a fool. And yet they go around spouting off about Shakespeare and George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, and yet they call you a fool for believing in Jesus Christ, from whom you have an eyewitness account, claiming more than 500 other eyewitness accounts of his resurrection, all of whom were alive at the time the thing was written, and nobody wrote a dissenting document saying, I talked to 30 of those 500 people, and it was all a hoax. None of them. There's no literature that says this is a hoax. Because it wasn't. And they could have easily disproved it. Second thing we find here as we look at this section today. Um, the, word of life, the word of life leads to eternal life. Lead verse 2. Concerning the word of life, verse 1, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. As you get older and you go past each one of those birthdays that has a zero on the end of it, it doesn't matter whether it's 20, 30, 40, you realize you're getting older. And the closer, the higher the number gets on the front end of that, the lower you realize the number is getting for how many years till I die. Now, to be honest with you, someone that just put zero, a two zero on could die tomorrow. And there are many 20 year olds that die. But for those of us who are in good health and think we have a long time, you start thinking, you know, how old are we going to live? 75? That seems young these days. Maybe we'll get to 90. Will I still be able to think right, you know? How many years do I have to get accomplished what I want to get done? And yet he's talking about here about eternal life. And that's what I'm looking forward to. I mean, I don't want to check out of this life anytime soon. I got too much stuff I'd still like to get done. At least I'd like to get through January and see if I get my doctorate. You know, that'd be nice. Get one thing, you know. But, uh, you know, we got a lot of stuff we want to do. And so, but this is eternal life. And it says, first of all, was manifested to us. And again, notice what he says. We have seen and bear witness and proclaim. That was the disciples' job. To see. Can I see that? You know, to see to behold, now to study it, and then to turn around and proclaim it to you so that we understand it and we know it. This book is important. If you come to that crisis in your life where you say, is it really a God? Is it really true? I've spoken here, not at length, but, but how I had to come to that place in my life when Jonathan's accident, I was looking at what happened. I mean, here I am, a, a pastor, all, I mean, I've never really, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're listing bad and good guys, I would fall in the good guy category for the most of my life. I mean, I've never even smoked for Pete's sake, you know? Uh, thankfully so, you know, but I were a pastor, you know, the good thing. But yet, this happens to me? Is there really a God? When you get to that crisis in your life and you've got to make that decision, is there really a God? Is there really a Jesus? Did he really raise? You know what you do? You have to come back to this page right here and say, we have seen, we bear witness, and we proclaim. And you have to say that John is an outright liar. And all these people that say, oh, I'm not sure if Jesus did that, I'm not sure if Jesus did that, they have to, they have to read this thing, understand these two verses, and say, John is an outright liar along with all those other 500 people who said they saw it, along with the disciples, they're all frauds and phonies. What else could you say? They couldn't be misguided people. No misguided person would try to prove it like this. Put so much energy into these verses. We manifest, so it was manifested to us, in other words, we saw it. In, in chapter 14 of his book, again, book of John, chapter 14, verse 26, he writes this. But the Comforter, that's the Holy Spirit, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is, he's, he's quoting Jesus at this point, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said to you. So what Jesus is saying is when, the, when I leave, the Holy Spirit's gonna come and all these things that you've seen and heard me say, you're gonna be able to remember them all. Now we know these people remember a lot back then. I mean, that when, they, when these Jews would look at the scriptures, they would, they would memorize it. 
they would memorize Genesis and Exodus. I mean, they, they couldn't just go down and open up the local scroll and read it. They didn't memorize it. So when you went to school, you memorized the scriptures. Lois's brother is memorizing the Bible, parts of the Bible right now. He's memorized the whole book of Hebrews. I'd be lucky to memorize three verses, you know? But uh, that's the way these people memorized back then. So don't think, oh, he's just trying to recall something he heard, you know, a couple of weeks ago. When these guys heard things, they remembered it, they were precise. But Jesus Christ told John and his disciples, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to help you remember every detail to the way you need to write this down to record it so it's accurately recorded. So it's not only written by men, but it's divinely inspired. God's, God himself is helping these men remember the very things that were written. And when you remember all the stuff the Jews would re, could remember and memorize, you realize that that is not as big as of a task it would be if I was trying to remember it. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you how much I forget, <laughs> you know? But these guys didn't happen. So now we go on here. So we have, it was manifested to us, and then he says, we manifested it to you. Ephesians 2, 9 says, and to, 3, 9 says, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for the ages have been hidden by God who created all things. So in other words, we have all these mysteries that we don't understand today, but the disciples and Paul were to understand those mysteries and reveal them to us by writing the word of God. And so that's how we know so much is because these guys detailed what was written to help us understand. That's why I went to school. That's why I had to learn Greek in order to read this book in Greek, you know, so I could understand the details and give you the details. And if you have a problem with it, understanding it, who do you go to? You come to us, the pastors. What does this mean? And we try to go off the top of our heads and from looking at the books, and if we can't, guess what? We go to the people in the books that are smarter than us and that have, have studied this thing, and that's all they do for a living. They don't stand up and preach to a congregation and and. and oversee fellowship hall projects and, and have counseling things and all this other kind of stuff. They do one thing, they teach, you know, and they teach Greek. Those are the kind of people that write the books and so we go to them and they help us understand it if there's a problem. So we can understand, so he says, we manifested this to you. The Great Commission says what? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature and that's what they were doing. All the disciples went and did that. So the lesson we learn here is eternal life comes from the Father. It came from the Father they understood it because it was shown to them, Jesus Christ and the Father, eternal life, and then they manifested it to us. They explained it to us. The third thing we find here, that then leads to fellowship. Read verse three. For what we, <laughs> do you think it's important that he saw and heard this stuff? Look what the third verse says. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you. So before he tells us, he's gonna say a third time. We saw it, we heard it, and now we're proclaiming it to you. Let there be no misunderstanding that this stuff is true. I saw it. And if you don't believe it, go ask any one of the other 12 disciples. Go ask any one of those 500 people that are still alive. Find it out. What I'm proclaiming, he says, that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So what are the most important words in this epistle? It's fellowship. What's fellowship? Two fellows stranded in a ship. Okay? Two fellows stranded in a ship. I mean, everybody, oh, I forget the name of it. It wasn't in my sermon notes. I didn't even, wasn't even going to mention it, but these things come to me, you know, it's like, maybe that's the Holy Spirit. Have you seen that? You ever seen that? What's that film with the guy that was stranded for 40 some days, was it? Or, huh? Castaway. It wasn't 40 some days. How many days was he on the. Anyway, did you know that that guy was a believer? Yeah. Unbroken. Unbroken. Yes. Unbroken. That guy was really a believer. And if you didn't know it, you can go onto the Billy Graham website and they have his, the rest of the story there. At the very end of the unbroken, it says his faith was important to him or something. That's all they say. But you read, this guy was actually, um, he, he was preaching. He came to Christ, his wife, he said, I'm not going to be accepted. He, came to, he, he went on a promise to his wife to a Billy Graham crusade and said, I am not going, heard the thing, and he walked out the first night. She begged him to go back the second night. He said, I'm only going back if I can walk out. As soon as he starts giving that invocation, I'm not going forward. Forward. And so she, she finally got him to go back. He went back. He stood in the back of the church. And as soon as it came, he got up, he walked to the aisle, and he couldn't walk out. He turned around and walked down. Became a believer and spent many years with Billy Graham, um, you know, uh, testifying his faith in Jesus Christ. This guy was on fire for the Lord. And uh, you won't see any of that film. But he was stranded in a ship by him, in, in this life raft by himself for so long. But can you imagine two guys? And, but, but there were three guys originally. 
and the other two guys eventually didn't make it. Uh, one guy did, right? So now you have two. So one guy didn't make it, and two guys did. And so you have two guys in a ship. You're going to have good fellowship at that point, aren't you? And that's what we need in the church. We need, we need the kind of fellowship that we're in this life raft together. And you know what? We've got to find a way. Sometimes you might like the, not like the other person in the life raft. But you know what? It's better than the sharks outside the life raft. And that's what we got in the church. We got a lot of people out there that say the church is not some place I want to go. I want to go to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites there. So you'd rather stay with them and wind up in hell forever? We need to realize that we have challenges within the church. And you might not like somebody. God forbid. There are a few people that haven't liked me over the years. Sometimes they say, sometimes they leave. But we're in fellowship with God and we're in fellowship with his son Jesus Christ and we're also in fellowship with one another and we need to realize that the only reason we get to jump ship if you're part of my pun today is because there's a bunch of other churches out there which people can go and you know find their needs met someplace else but such wasn't true in this day when you went to Corinth you didn't go to the first Corinthian church and then to the second Corinthian church or to the fourth Corinthian church. You went to the Corinthian church and that was it. It was them and the world. It was the church headed to heaven with Jesus Christ or the world with all their gods and headed to hell. And sometimes the day our problem is we have too many options. When I was overseas, <laughs> um, you know, there was, they built, the, the bad guys were outside the wall and the good guys were inside. It was the opposite of jail, <laughs> okay? So we're the good guys inside this thing, you know? And there was a wall. And guess what? Those guys didn't get to go and say, I'm going to go to first so-and-so church out at, you know, uh, uh, Farazai. No, there wasn't any church in Farazai. It, it was a Muslim country. And if you went out there in Farazai, even they had a church, and they did have some missionaries over there who were preaching the gospel, you didn't get to go out there. You had your choice. Us four chaplains on post, and that was it. Now, I guess you could go to another chapter, you could say there's four different churches. But I, I, sometimes I wish they just built a wall around Morrisville. Now, for you people outside of Morrisville, I'm sorry because I still want you to come in, okay? But just for one Sunday, I will tell you, there are so many believers in Morrisville. They go out to all these other fancy churches, and all oh, they've got a bigger youth group, they got a bigger, uh, you know, uh, Sunday school, they got a better preacher, you know? I know there's no more better preachers than what we have in this church, but they, they think they are. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, they're all something better, and they're going to all these other bigger churches, and here they are in Morrisville, and they could be winning their own people in Morrisville to Jesus Christ. We could have such an impact here. And you people that come from outside Morrisville, God bless you, and I want you here, okay? And the people in your area need to be find, find Jesus Christ also. And we need to start life groups in your area, you know, so people in your friends can come to your, your house for a life group and see what they're like and come to know Jesus Christ there because we want to expand and reach out to so everybody knows Jesus. But you know, it's a, a, you wish kind of was a wall and there isn't a wall. And so people go to what they want to find. But fellowship is a part of the body of Christ. We need to look at each other as the ones that are in this ship and that we have all kinds of relationships and that of other people out there, they aren't going to have the same perspectives that we have. And so that's why we have the small groups or what we call life groups is so that we can gain that closer fellowship. So there's someone else to say, yeah, you have a problem, I'll help you. Let's, let's, let's take, a, take, a, take a move on that. I'm going to keep on going here. We'll get, let's fellowship with, I have, I, have all, I have all kinds of stuff we can say about this. Fellowship with other believers. I'm going to skip most of this, but it's like, let's, let's just think of this. Let's think of this as a baseball game, okay? And uh, I should play a football team Oh, he's a baseball. Well, this is a football, okay? Um, as much as I knew about football, you know, my, my son was D-line, you know, and he loved D-line because he wanted to, have to get the tackle the quarterback. That was his thing, get the blood on the quarterback, you know? And you've got the, you've got the center. Last week, I recall, didn't, they, didn't, the, didn't the center hike the ball and the guy wasn't looking and just went off him and they got a fumble? How many of you remember that play? I thought you were trying to forget that play, yeah. <laughs> that's that's got to be so embarrassing. But anyway, um, you know, but every person has their part. If the center hikes the ball before the quarterback wants the ball, guess what happens? We saw a fumble, you know? But what would it be like if the quarterback said, I don't want the center anymore. We're not going to have a center. I'm going to take the ball myself. So he walks up to the front line, takes the ball, and eliminates the center. Is that team going to go very far? 
No, he probably won't make it past the third play. He'll get crucified. You got that line, if the, and, and they're complaining. Oh, he didn't get the ball to out because the line's not giving him enough time to throw the ball. Well, that very well could be true. You could be the best quarterback in the world, even Tom Brady. And if the, if the front line lets the players through, guess what? You're going to last one or two plays, and you're going to have a broken leg or something because every single person is important. And that's what the church is like, the fellowship of the church. Even the Godhead is like that. God the Father did what? He's the, he's known as the, he makes the decrees. He's known as the creator. But Jesus Christ was also, it says, involved with creation. And Jesus Christ is what? We call him the Savior, right? He died on the cross. Did God the Father die on the cross? Well, I mean, they're three in one, but Jesus Christ's job was to be Savior, to die on the cross, and to, um, to, in, to be a part of our lives and to give us directions. So the Holy Spirit, what's his job? His job now is to, in, to live inside us. The Holy Spirit does not do the Father's job. The Father does not do the Son's job. The Son does not do the Holy Spirit's job. They work together, and yet they're all one being. And so really is the church. We are one being. We are the body of Christ. One being, one purpose, one goal, and yet each of us have different functions. Pete's been coming out a couple nights a week and helping with electric back here. You don't want me handling the electric. I've done it, and I can do it under the tutelage of somebody with Dan, you know, he says, do this, and I've, and I've done it, you know. Um, he shows me how to twist those, those things together, you know. He says, do it like this, and they're twisted. I tried 10 times and they're still not twisted right, you know what I'm, so 10 minutes later, I've got one thing twisted and he could have been done the whole, the whole, the whole room in one, at the time I did one. You know, we each have different talents and abilities and that's what it is on the football team. Every person has a different responsibility. We do our responsibilities, but we don't get mad because somebody else just happened not to do theirs right. We still do our part right and we still realize that you're valuable. And when I, and this is not a, a ditch on any of the big churches, but let me tell you, if you have a team like Morrisville here, where my son played, and we have so few players, he played on the, on the uh, offense and the defense, played the whole game, maybe got out of three plays. If you lose a player in that situation, what does it do to the team? <laughs> it's really bad. Yes, you've coached them with the Morrisville teams. You know, doesn't you? Now, if you go to Pensbury, where they got 85 people that couldn't get on the team because they were just a smidgen too low, if you lose a guy there, what do you do? I hope you have a nice day. Next guy, come on, right here. You just keep on filling the things. And that's what it's like at the church. We're a small church. When we lose a player, we hurt. You know? When we gain a player, <laughs> it's terrific. You go to some other church, you're there, I'm sure you'll do something nice, you know, but here you're so valuable. And every church is like that. I've just finished my paper on the dissertation, waiting for my, my people to write back to me on it and tell me how bad I did my, my readers. But uh, it's on the small church, those churches which are down to 35 and about to close. How do they revitalize themselves? Or in my case, we're talking about restarts. Because the smaller people is so much more important. So if, I'm, if fellowship's important to, to John and it's important to the Father, let me tell you, it's even more important to us that we fellowship with each other and realize that we're two people or maybe 120 people in a ship and every person counts. So the third thing we have on our, and the third, the third um, theme or, or lesson I want to put out here is that fellowship is critical to the body of Christ. The fourth thing, and we'll take just a short time here, uh, it's, it's which leads to complete joy. So we wind up with the word of life leads to eternal life, which leads to fellowship, which leads to complete joy. I'll share a couple of verses here, from, again from the book of John. John 15, 11. These things I've spoken to you that your joy, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full or complete. That's what Jesus Christ is saying to these disciples. John heard it from Jesus himself. Chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus again. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not, excuse me, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. Talking about what, how the world viewed Jesus' works. And then lastly, in chapter 17, verse 13, again to the disciples. But now I have come to you, and these things I speak to the, to, in the world, 
that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Think of all the songs with joy in them. You know, there's joy in serving Jesus. I have the, from the mega sports games, I have the joy, 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 down in my heart. Um, Philippians chapter four, verse four says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Do you want joy in your life? How do you get complete and full joy? The world tries to find all the ways. Give me a good job. Find me a job, you know? Find me a, uh, find me a house to live in. Get me a car, you know? Well, uh, in fact, give me a million dollars. That would make everything right, right? And yet, those people that get a million dollars, within six months, it's gone. And their families hate them. You didn't give me any of that money, you stingy little, you know? What's money do? What do you want in life? Do you want money? Do you want riches? Do you want success? Do you want fame? Or do you want joy? Make my joy complete. So many people do not know how to have joy. And it's because they don't understand these four verses. You don't get joy from money, riches, jobs, or anything else. You get it from knowing Jesus Christ. And if you are sitting here this morning and have never come to the place of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior so that he controls your life inside and out, so that something really tragic happens in your life, like we believe happened in our lives, although God knows for good, you know, or something really good happens in your life, understand that that's not the way to get joy through external stuff. It comes from the inside. And those people who try to get it by the external stuff eventually lose it. It's like a, it's like a flash and gone. My paper, I use the illustration, it's like a, a camper who has one match left in the winter and he strikes the last match. That's done. Nothing else. So if you want to know what complete joy is, what full joy is from the inside, look at John. And over the next weeks, we'll talk about how to get that. Because he says, make my joy complete, make my joy full. John's going to give us the answer in this very simple book, which even I could translate back in seminary <laughs> in Greek. And let's look at what he has to say. I close out this morning with basically our, our outline as my theme. What's the outline? The word of life leads to eternal life, fellowship, and complete joy. Dear Lord, we thank you for the joy that you give us. We thank you that it says joy in serving Jesus. Uh, joy doesn't come from going home and doing everything else we do. Joy may come a little bit from our work that we work, from the success we get there, but real joy comes from knowing you as our personal Savior, knowing that you will take us through every situation your way. We thank you for the joy that only you can give. May it be our present and our gift that we receive from you this week and every week in Jesus' name. Amen.